Hey there, Night Owls. My name is Matt, and uh, this is Bump in the Night. So, this is the very first episode of a podcast that I've been wanting to do for a while, uh, basically based on anything creepy and disturbing that will keep you up at night. Uh, I'm talking ghosts, hauntings, haunted places, serial killers, conspiracies, cryptids, uh, supernatural beings, anything that is absolutely creepy, I want to talk about on this show. And I decided to kick it off with a unbelievably disturbing uh, individual. Uh, we're going to talk about Pedro Alonso Lopez, aka the Monster of the Andes. And I've listened to a lot of true crime podcasts, watched a lot of true crime, and I had never heard of this guy. Um, and I was just doing research for another topic and discovered him and got sucked down the rabbit hole. Um, this man is, if you can even call him a man, is possibly one of the worst serial killers, especially by body count, that I've ever read about. He was a very disturbed individual. Um, sadly, uh, only 110 of his victims have been proven. But this guy has confessed to over 300 victims. 300! Ted Bundy, BTK, uh, you know, John Wayne Gacy, all of them, 30s to 40s, which is still a, sh a lot of people, but 300 people. And what makes this guy even worse is his choice of victims were young girls. Uh, he liked them young. 9 to 12 was his victim profile range. Um, little girls uh, off the streets of Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Uh, so it sucks. And just a fair warning, if you are going to be bothered by talking about the death of children, I would probably skip this episode because there's quite a bit in here. And I'd, I'm not going to go into the super grisly details of how he did it and all of that, but there's going to be talk about that. So if you don't want to hear that, you know, move on. But let's get started talking about this despicable human being. Pedro Alonso Lopez. He was born on October 8th, 1948, in Talmia, Colombia. Uh, he was the seventh of 13 children. Now, that's a lot of kids. I got one kid, and he is a handful. I can't even imagine having 13 children. 13! Uh, sadly, his father was killed uh, when his mother was only three months pregnant with Lopez. Um, so there was no father in the in the picture, and his mother was sadly a prostitute. Um, and I definitely believe that nature versus nurture creating the serial killer. He was definitely a nurtured serial killer. He was created. That's not to say that he didn't have you know these dark desires and and messed up thoughts in his head but a lot of shit happened to him in his life that i think really molded him into the monster that he became um but yeah his mother like i said was a prostitute <laughs> she's not gonna win mother of the year ever um she regularly kept her children in line through the use of violence i mean she she abused these kids on a massive level which was not good. I mean, it definitely put a dark side into a young Lopez. Uh, but, you know, fast forward to Lopez when he was about eight years old, and his mother caught him sexually assaulting his sister. So, I mean, like I said, obviously there was some darkness in there to begin with if he was willing to do that. And in some of the sources I read, um, he was just touching her breasts and i say just because that's still very screwed up but it's better than raping his sister or doing something more i suppose but either way he was being inappropriate with his sister which is not good so what was mommy dearest solution she decided to gather him up drive him to the edge of the city and leave him there just leave him you're touching your sister's boob 
we drop you off on the edge of town. I, it doesn't work for me. And it didn't really work because he literally just wandered back home. So the next day, she packed him up on a bus and they drove 200 miles away to the city of, oh God, I hope this is how I say it, Bogota, Bogota, I believe, but it's the cala- the capital city of Colombia. And she left his ass there. She just left him. Went back to the town. As far as I could find, I don't think he had any contact with any of his siblings or his mother again throughout his life. Uh, but that, maybe I just missed it, but I, I don't think he had any contact with them. So, you know, literally touch your sister's boob abandoned for life at eight years old. You know, here's the thing. I, most serial killers... I feel no sympathy for them as adults. They have done horrible things. They have taken lives, ruined people's lives. But I can feel sympathy for the child. He's eight years old. He hasn't done anything yet that that deserved that. Uh, he definitely needed help, and, and her being a prostitute probably couldn't have done that. She was in poverty. She probably couldn't get the mental health. Plus, it was 1948. Well, by that time, it was 1956. So eh, mental health was probably not that high up. But just leaving him there? Uh, And it just gets worse. Uh, You know, frightened and alone in a city hundreds of miles from anything that he knew about. uh, An older man showed up and... You know, sadly, the world is a dark place. He offered Pedro uh, food, a place to stay. So, you know, a warm belly and safety. Uh, You know, thinking this was too good to be true, of course, Lopez, except he's eight years old. He's alone. Of course, if somebody offers him food and a place to stay, he is going to accept it. And the world being the way it is. This older man took Pedro to an abandoned home and repeatedly sodomized him. Um, so he was he was repeatedly raped. And I believe this is truly when the darkness was set in. Like his mother leaving him and the abuse and what he saw his mother doing for her job definitely instilled a darkness. But this was the start of it really taking grips on him. Um, so after that, he was living on the street, begging, stealing what he could. Um, and he did this for years. It wasn't just, you know, a couple months. He, he did this for a couple years, uh, more than a couple years. He did it for four years because around the age of 12 is the next time he kind of surfaced. And, uh, an American family actually living in Colombia uh, took him in. And gave him a place to stay. And they even enrolled him in a school for the orphans. Uh, so that he could get an education. Um, you know, they they were trying to give him something. Give him protection. But again, the world is a very, very dark place. And he only lasted two years in the school. Because it came out that a male teacher was molesting him. Um, so he, he ran away. Uh, and again, so far now, he has, you got to think about in his mind, he is now seeing that sex and violence come hand in hand, at least in his world, that if sex is involved, there has to be violence. Um, but like I said, he ran away from that family um, back to the only thing he knew, which was the streets. Um and to support himself, he it started to escalate. Instead of just begging, he started doing petty burglaries. And the big one was stealing cars. Um, so after that time, he was eventually arrested in 1966 at the age of 18. And sentenced to a Colombian prison for three years. His sentence was three years. And like I said, I, I feel bad for him at this age before he did anything um, because on the second day of his incarceration three men brutally gang raped him uh, 
three adults ganged up on him and raped him. Um, the prisons out in Colombia are not like the prisons here. The inmates are not all, you know, locked in cells or, you know, they're not alone. They're not watched as well. It's it's basically a small city inside some walls. And the guards do have a little bit of control. But as far as I've seen, they kind of are left to their own. And they are able to just kind of walk freely. And so these guys were able to gang rape him. Um, but he definitely did not let that stand. He vowed revenge on them. And throughout his stint inside the prison, he systematically tracked them down and slit their throats. So I don't like saying that I agree. Uh, but if these three men are willing to gang rape an 18 year old, I'm not really sweating them no longer being on this planet. I don't agree with murder, but couldn't have happened to nicer guys. Um, and the, the weird thing is the authorities deemed it and it was self-defense. Um, so in some things I've read, it said that after he murdered those three guys, uh, no time was added on because of the self-defense. Uh, it was no time was added on. Uh, some other ones I heard, or I read that it was uh, three years were added to his sentence. Or no, two years were added to his sentence. Um, I'm not sure. But either way, he was released in 1969, and this is when he just gave into that darkness, and this is when people believe that the killings started. So he started luring, raping, and murdering nine to twelve year old girls. Uh, he would, but he would travel between the countries of Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador. Those were his three hunting grounds. Um, and what he said he would do was he would walk around the markets and search for a girl with a certain look on her face, a look of innocence and beauty, as he put it. And I've got a lovely quote from this gentleman. In his own words, I followed them sometimes for two or three days, waiting for the moment when she was left alone. I would give her a pretty and shining trinket, then get her to leave with me, for the edge of town where I promised to give her another trinket for her mother. So he used shinies to get them. I mean, nine to 12 year olds, especially these people or these children were probably living in poverty. So you offer them something nice, you offer them something shiny. And I mean, and even offering something for their mother, um, he was able to, to lure them in. What he would do is he would lead them to a hideout somewhere on the outskirts of town, which as disturbing, you know, it, gets, it adds on to it. What's really disturbing is nine times out of ten, this hideout is where he had previously dug graves of previous victims or for his current victims. Um, and I mean, even in some cases, he would lure them over there and you could still see previous victims sitting in this grave. And that's where he brought him. And fair warning, trigger warning for anyone listening, this part is going to get pretty dark. Um, so if you don't want to don't want to hear about this, skip ahead a little bit. Um, so when he would get them to their hideouts from there, he would brutally rape and strangle the girls to death. Um, strangulation was his main motive of killing. Um, but he he took evil to a whole new level. Um, again, this is going to get really dark. He refused to kill his victims at night. He, he only waited until the sunlight was out. He said it would have been a waste in the dark. I had to watch them by daylight. At the first sign of light, I would get excited. I forced the girl into sex and put my hands around her throat when the, when the sun rose. I would strangle her. It was only good if I could see her eyes. That level of fucked upness, he could only get off and get his jollies if he could see 
these girls dying, if he could look into their eyes and see the life leave them, that is what he wanted. He wanted to see the terror in their eyes. He wanted to see them as they died. He is a fucking monster. That, to me, I I know some of the other serial killers out there are fucking terrible, but that, just that quote is bone chilling. Bone chilling. So, and he didn't just stop there. So he would do that. And uh, he would return to the graves periodically, and he would prop up the bodies of his victims, and as he put it, he would have tea parties. This sick bastard would kill these little girls, and then have these little tea parties that he would talk to their bodies. These girls that he raped and murdered. This man is fucking... He said, my little friends like to have company. I have to put three or four girls in a single hole and talk to them. It was like having a party. But after a while, because they couldn't move, I got bored and went out looking for new girls. Jesus fucking Christ. That is a whole level. And, and. Ted Bundy, you know, he went back to the bodies and he was into necrophilia. Uh, John Wayne Gacy, he had the bodies in his crawl space. Every other serial killers took mementos and things like that. Those, I don't want to say almost make sense. Not the necrophilia, that's fucking, that, that, it's a whole other thing that, that doesn't make sense, that's disgusting. But, psychologically it makes sense that when a serial killer takes a a token or a, a, a prize from their victim it's so that they can go back and relive the killing and the excitement that they got from it this bastard went and had fucking tea parties with dead little girls that he had raped and murdered i i mean maybe it's the same thing as taking trinkets it's a thrill but that doesn't make any sense to me it that's uh, just on another level so he continued his killings without repercussions until 1978 but his luck ran out for a little bit because while trying to kidnap a nine-year-old girl from the northern peruvian community from their nor- northern community the, and I'm really hoping I say this right, Ayacucho Indians captured the serial killer. He was trying to take a nine-year-old girl, and she got he got caught. Um, and I will actually post a picture of said little girl and her mother on the Instagram. So go and take a, uh, a peek at that. I'll post some other pictures, too, of Pedro and, and a few other things. Um, and I'll, I'll leave the link for that in the uh, description, but he was captured by the Ayacucho Indians, and according to their customs, the punishment for this type of crime was death. Freaking great. Kill the bastard. Kill the bastard. Lopez even uh, recounted that. He said, they had placed me, they had placed syrup on me, and were going to let me be eaten by the ants. That would be a horrible way to die. Horrible way. And if anybody fucking deserves it, it's fucking Pedro Lopez. He deserves it. But of course, luck turned in his advantage and some American Christian missionaries rolled up into the freaking village and convinced the natives that killing was wrong and that he needed to be handed over to the Peruvian police. Are you fucking kidding me? This man deserves to be eaten by ants. He deserves to be eaten by ants. He he deserves far worse than being eaten by ants. Like, And they said it was wrong. And sadly, the people agreed. Begrudgingly agreed. From what I read, they were not happy about it. But 
they gave him over to the Peruvian police. And for some fucking unknown reason, they drove that bastard to the Colombian border and they let him go. Are you kidding me? Like, I would assume that these people would have told them that Lopez was trying to kidnap a girl. But they let him go. And of course, from there, he continued his killing spree. Stayed out of Peru, bounced between Colombia and Ecuador. And what's even more disturbing is he admitted that he enjoyed Ecuador girls the most. He goes, I like the girls in Ecuador. They are more gentle and trusting, more innocent. They're not suspicious of strangers as Colombia girls are. Well, at least the Colombian girls are smart, because I shouldn't say that. Ecuadorian girls are smart, too, I'm sure. It's just, uh, it's so heartbreaking that he's literally like, oh, these little girls are gentle and trusting and so innocent, so I was able to prey on them easily. Fuck it. Fuck you, dude. (sighs) But finally, uh, in 1979, his actions... I want to say started catching up to him. It didn't so much catch up to him yet, but it started putting the authorities, making them aware that someone out there was preying on little girls because a river overflowed near the town of Ambato in Ecuador. I hope I pronounced that right. right? And it washed up the bodies of four young girls. And again, trigger warning, because this gets gnarly, when they did the investigations, they found that three of the little girls had been strangled so intensely that their eyes had popped from their socket. The amount of anger, because strangling someone is very, has, is very personal. You're getting up close, you're getting your hands around their throat, you can feel them. He squeezed them so hard that their eyeballs popped out of their fucking sockets. He's a goddamn monster. And to make it even worse, the fourth girl, whose eyes were okay, they said that her face was frozen in absolute terror. Frozen that way. So you know this poor little girl's last moments were absolute terror. And here's the thing. When I do follow or or more videos and more podcasts on serial killers i really want to try and and promote the names and stuff of the victims because i truly believe that their stories need to be told as as you know a form of caution but i want to to just always remember them they need to be remembered and sadly this the the countries he came from and just the sheer number that were not found and and a lot of these were from you know villages that were hidden throughout the the countries um we don't know their names we we don't know their names we don't know pictures nothing so in the future i will definitely focus on the victims in this one i I don't have any info on them so i i'm trying to be very respectful of them but in the future i definitely want to focus on them more but anyway Finally, the bastard, it became real for Lopez because in March 1980, he was arrested by the Ecuadorian police when he attempted to abduct a 12-year-old girl. Another one. This guy's gotten caught twice now. Uh, The police were were very suspicious of this man because, again, they had noticed that little girls had gone missing, uh, the bodies had, you know washed up and they were very suspicious of of Lopez but of course he refused to talk he wasn't going to give anything up so they tricked him a priest named Pastor Gonzalez dressed as a prisoner and became Pedro Lopez's new cellmate uh he told Lopez that he was in jail for rape, trying to, you know, earn his trust. Rapist to rapist. Apparently, you can trust a fellow rapist. Ah, ah. Seems a bit sketched to me. 
Um, but anyway, he said that to earn his trust, and it took him time, but eventually Lopez started to open up. Can I just say, Pastor Gonzalez, you are the fucking man. I was a corrections officer for a little while in an American prison. And there's some scary shit that happens in prisons. I cannot imagine what would happen. I would stay the fuck. Colombia, Ecuadorian, Peruvian. I don't want to be in any foreign prison other than, you know, Switzerland. Because apparently they get, like, TVs and shit. Which, hey. Um, I didn't want to dress up as and fake being an inmate at a freaking... Uh, this is Ecuador. Ecuadorian prison. He said, for 27 days, I hardly slept. Afraid I'd be strangled in my bed. But I tricked Lopez into confessing. It was beyond my wildest nightmares. He told me everything. Fucking Pastor Gonzalez is the man. Fucking sleeping next to this monster and getting him to confess to him about his crimes. So when he first started confessing, he confessed to 110 murders. But Gonzalez worked on him more, and he admitted to another 240 victims. So well over 300 long, uh, young girls could possibly have died at his hands. Um, so the investigators were obviously a bit skeptical. I would be too. Somebody comes to me and says, I've killed 300 plus children. Like, eh, did you though? Um, but sadly, he quickly was able to prove himself. He led the officers to 53 bodies buried throughout the area. Just 53. So... Once they once they started finding bodies that he was quickly able to lead them to, they started believing him. Oh, I'm going to butcher this name, but Major Victor Lescano? I believe it's Lescano. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, let me know. Uh, he was the director of the Ambato prison, and he said, If someone confesses to 50... Well, I can't talk. If someone confesses to 53... And you find hundreds more that he didn't, you tend to believe what he says. And he said, I think his estimate of 300 is very low. Because in the beginning he cooperated with us, took us each day to three or four hidden corpses. But then he got tired, changed his mind, and he just stopped helping. So, shit, he, he admitted to, looks like 350 victims, but... This guy, who's the one of the lead, the director of the prison, he believes that it could be way more, which is terrifying. So once the newspapers got a hold of the story, they began to call Pedro the monster of the Andes, which is a fitting name because he's not a man; he's a fucking monster. Uh, in 1981, he was initially just going to be charged with the 53 murders that. They found the bodies of. But uh, after consideration, the authorities decided to charge him with the 110. So total of 110 is what he was, was being charged with. Um, in 1983, they went to court and he was convicted for the killings and sentenced to life imprisonment. Um, and his prison time would be spent for the most part in solitary confinement, rarely even interacting with other prisoners or guards. And before you get excited and say, yay, Pedro's off the street, he's gone, he's never going to get out, hold on, because this really sucks, and we'll get to it. So when he was talked to, it says you have to ask, you really have to ask yourself, how does someone become this? And like I said earlier, I believe it was definitely a case of nurture, but I mean, he did have some dark issues to begin with. I mean, the thing with the sister, I, I would say it's a, it's a healthy mix of nature and nurture. I would say more nurture than nature. Um, but Lopez attributes his crimes to witnessing the acts of prostitution while he was growing up, which, sure, 
it probably obviously it wasn't good you shouldn't i mean his mom doing her job to provide for her family in front of the kids the acts of prostitution it definitely had an effect on him i'm sure but there are plenty of people that see that shit and go to therapy and live happy healthy lives and i think that's an excuse i do believe it didn't help along with him being gang raped him being raped by an old man he was taught very early that sex and violence go together and i believe probably the only way he could get his jollies off is if he mixed the two and sadly the little girls became the victims of that um he even said like i said he said that the the prostitution is what affected his psyche he says i lost my innocence at age eight so i decided to do the same thing to as many girls as i could which fucking monster yeah i got fucked up so i'm gonna just go fuck up all these other girls lives 350 plus girls lives and not only their lives i mean you got to think about the families a lot of times he would snatch these girls when their mothers and them were in the market and mom turns around snatch girls gone think about that what what that does to you as a parent never knowing where your daughter is never knowing what happened to her it's just i i don't understand how you losing your innocence gives you the right to fuck over hundreds of people and here's where it gets because you're probably wondering what happened to pedro lopez here's where i got so angry so due to ecuador's laws even though he admitted to killing over 300 girls and was sentenced to life they have a law in place that even with a life sentence the maximum a prisoner can serve is 20 years 300 killings 20 year sentence technically life sentence but a maximum of 20 years what the fuck and from what i read the reason that law is there is so that leaders of the country they didn't want a leader to be dethroned and then have that leader be viciously killed because apparently back in the day they would dethrone a leader of the country he would go to prison get tortured all that and then i guess in one case it said uh a dethroned leader was ripped apart by horses uh, and they said that it's too much bloodshed doesn't make sense to me you kill 300 people i think you, if you kill 300 people you take them outside the sh to behind the shed and you put a bullet in his head done don't have to worry about that anymore 20 even a life sentence to me is is not enough just put a bullet in his head be done with it be done so as aggravating as it is on January 1st, 1999, Jesus, I was eight years old. 1999, 51-year-old Pedro Lopez was fucking released. Are you kidding me? The Ecuadorian government even gave him a new shirt, a nice new pair of shoes, a bottle of water, a package of food, and a small amount of Colombian pesos and set him loose on the Colombian border. So they they essentially deported him is what they were. They said he doesn't have a license to live in Ecuador. So Colombia, he's your problem. Fucking just. Even the governor of the prison who he was held with said, God save the children. He is unreformed and totally remorseless. This whole nightmare may start again. And he's right. He's right. Because here's the thing, no one knows where Pedro Lopez is today. He's been seen in the mountains between Ecuador and Colombia. Um, but they have there's been sightings of him, but they've never been confirmed. So, I mean, I guarantee this man did not just get released, get reformed, and stop killing kids. Uh, I guarantee he's out there doing it. 
um, even now. And by now, he's in his 70s. He would be in his 70s, so he could be dead. You never know. But I guarantee he didn't stop. Um, and my big reason is this quote right here. Um, it is spine-chilling to hear this man talk like this. Uh, again, trigger warning, if you don't want to hear something dark, I would skip ahead 15 seconds or whatever. If there's any doubt that this monster has not and will not kill again, let me leave you with this. A few years before his release, he was quoted as saying, There is a wonderful moment, a divine moment, when I have my hands around a young girl's throat. I look into her eyes and see a certain light, a spark, suddenly go out. Only those who kill know what I mean. The moment of death is enthralling and exciting. Someday when I am released, I will feel that moment again. I will be happy to kill again. It is my mission. He definitely has killed more people. And it, it's this is one of those cases that aggravates me because you have a man that killed 300 fucking plus people and we fucking let him go. And he says shit like that. Yeah, no shit. The fucking governor of that prison was right. He is unreformed and unrepentant. And he, he'll he kill again. I mean, it's his mission, he said. So, you know, Jesus Christ. But that is the story of Pedro Alonso Lopez, a.k.a. the Monster of the Andes. It's pretty dark. Pretty disturbing. And, uh, yeah. So that's his story. So the podcast is going to be a lot like this. I'm going to try and go with something a little bit nicer next week or next week, next uh, episode. Uh, to give you guys a little bit of a hint, it's going to be a legend of sorts that has to do with the Navajo people. I'm sure many of you will be able to guess what I'm talking about. Um, and I'm super excited to talk about that. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed listening. I hope you enjoyed uh, learning about that fucked up individual. And I hope you guys stay tuned for future episodes. Uh, feel free to follow the Instagram. Um, I'm going to have a YouTube up soon. And uh, yeah, so again, Night Owls, thanks for listening. And uh, I will see you next episode.